Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings here at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Thursday, February 1st, 2024, and it is uh, great to have a guest today. Tonight is Ship Selection Night for the Midshipmen Class of 2024 who are going to be surface warfare officers in the Navy. And so with me today is the SWO boss, Vice Admiral Brendan McLean. He is Commander of Naval Surface Forces, the senior surface warfare officer in the Navy, other than the CNO. But you're the and Admiral Grady. You're the boss. Yeah. You're the you're the boss of the of that community, yeah. uh, and you're here uh, as as the swell boss always yeah. is for ship selection, which is a great event with a lot of energy. Uh, sir, it's great to have you in the in the. Thank you for studio. having me, Bill. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I'll I'll point out to our listeners a year ago now. Your predecessor, uh, Vice Admiral Kitchener, was also here for ship selection, stopped by to do a podcast. So I sense a tradition building, okay. which I'm a big fan of. So Me too. You know, let's, let's build this into the turnover. Before we get into some of the discussion we want to have about your priorities and yeah. you know, programmatics of the surface community, uh, can't help but notice front page news across the country, across the world right now, is what's happening in the Red Sea, yeah. the Gulf of Aden, Houthis firing missiles and, and uh, uh, unmanned systems, drones at ships in the uh, uh, headed towards the the uh, you know it, through the Red Sea towards the Strait of Hormuz uh, and towards the uh, the Suez Canal. So a big international effort, largely led by the U.S. Navy right now, to protect maritime commerce in that vital waterway. What are you hearing from the commanders, the captains of ships out there, the crews out there, as they are protecting those? Uh, merchant ships. I think uh, what, what I'm hearing uh, most of all is confidence. You know, confidence in the the sailors, uh, in the equipment, in the mission. Uh, they are aggressively, you know, defending uh, themselves and uh, shipping going through that vital waterway, and it is a. Uh, it's a very difficult mission that they're doing, and they're doing it. I mean, they're making it look easy, but you know it's not. I mean, they're they're living in the weapons engagement zone uh, for for days at a time, and uh, the amount of preparation that you need to do, and the amount of readiness that you have to like the the heightened readiness states that those ships have to maintain in order to uh, be able to defend themselves at a moment's notice, very high. Um, there is a, um, you, know, you don't have a lot of time. The, right. the geography is very tight there, a missile launch. We're talking a matter of very few minutes from being able to detect to be able to, to, to launch uh, and, uh, and then see if you've shot it down or not. So it's, uh, they're really living on the edge right now um, and they're doing really, really well. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um... So you've been in the seat as SWO boss for about two months now. Mm -hmm. uh, talk a little bit about your vision for the surface force and, and your top-level priorities. Yeah, so you, this is interesting. This is a nice tie into the tradition part because you, you, you mentioned that, uh, that Admiral Kitchener was here last year. And, uh, you know, I was surflant back then, and we worked on our competitive edge strategy together. And, and I think that the, the continuity there is, is the one that I'm going to be uh, pressing for. We've got uh, five uh, lines of effort for our competitive edge strategy. We see the surface force as the force in the United States Navy that's going to give us the competitive edge uh, against our competitors. And uh, the things that we've been doing for the last two years along that strategy for our people, um, our ships, uh, new uh, technology and new uh, ships that are coming in, as well as the foundation that supports all of that. Um, we're going to be looking at that in the next uh, few months to see if we need or how we're going to update that and then really kind of accelerate. But I see the strategy overall not changing. We'll tweak it. Uh, we, you know, we've been learning for the last two years, so we'll update it. Uh, but I think our strategy for competitive edge uh, to get us to our North Star of 75 warships ready to fight and win is going to be uh, maintained. Within that strategy, I really have four big priorities, war fighting, sailors, maintenance, and safety. Um, we can kind of talk a little bit more uh, about those uh, if you're interested. But um, I think that uh, that those Four foundational things within and across our lines of effort are going to be what we're going to be focusing on. 
Well, it's interesting you brought up 75 ships. I was going to ask you that because that, that was yeah. uh, a big priority for Admiral Kitchener yeah. that he mentioned last year at SNA yeah. and then on our podcast, this idea that you would constantly have 75 you know, mission-capable ships. And so yeah. it sounds like that goal has stayed consistent. It sure has. Yeah, so I'm, I'm committed to that as well. I mean, the, uh, the, the requirements um, for us to be able to respond um, to a, a crisis, that, that number hasn't changed. So... Uh, we're, we're committed to getting there. We have been learning a lot in the last year on, on how we're going to do that. Um, the latest number that we have right now is 60. Okay. Um, so it's, it kind of it fluctuates based on like how many ships are in avails, right. how many ships are on deployment. Um, and there's always, but we're, we've been, uh, we hit a high uh, last summer at around, uh, I think, 63, 64. And then it kind of went back down to 55. But now we're back up to 60. Um, and we're working very closely with each individual ship to make sure that they've got everything that they need to make sure that they're ready to go. Gotcha. So I would imagine that uh, of those four pillars you, you talked about, you know, the, the sailors is one part of that, yeah. getting to 75 ships. Yeah. Uh, the maintenance is a big part, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, one of the things that Admiral Kitchener mentioned last year, uh, and, and we know it came out of the, uh, the Comprehensive Readiness Review and the Strategic Readiness Review, uh, was the Surface Readiness Group. So these yeah. were new commands, 06 level, being stood up in the, the fleet concentration areas to really go after uh, readiness, uh, surface ship readiness. So how are those, those commands are now... Are they all stood up? I think last so year there was a couple of them that were correct. stood up. Correct. So. Uh, we stood the, the first one up as a surface group uh, in Yoko, uh, Japan, in uh, 2018. Got um, it. And we, the, the organization we have that, that uh, is Surface Squadron 14 in Mayport is essentially a group. So we renamed okay. it. So we've already had that. We had a, a, a group in Bahrain. Um, that had been running for uh, for several years. It, it started off as PC Ron, then we took in the MCMs. We called it uh, uh, Naval Surface Squadron Five, and uh, and then now it's just it's going to become a group. So so some of these things we already had well established. They were running. We learned a lot from them. But the two areas that we didn't have it uh, that uh, Admiral Kitchener and I realized that we needed the most were Norfolk and San Diego. So. Standing those up, those went, um, uh, those stood up on the 14th of December last year, and uh, we're we're learning as we're as we're going. But the uh, they own all the ships in the maintenance and basic phase. Got it. Will will there be one in Rota and in uh, yes. Pearl Harbor? Yeah, as so well? so uh, absolutely. So the the, the mid pack um, organization was already established. So they've got. So we, we've but to. To make everybody sound the same with the same title, we have grouped them all so they all wear those hats. Yeah. You made some month, uh, some news this month with uh, talking about a, a disappointment about the progress of directed energy weapons yeah. Uh, yeah. for the surface force. Yep. Uh, and and I will note that a number of people in proceedings and on our, our online. Uh, forums and I heard some conversations about this at SNA. You know, we're shooting down the Navy's shooting down Houthi drones, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollar drones, with million or multi million dollar standard missiles, right? Well, I mean, they're and, not that much, but okay, you know, but they're expensive. Yeah, they're expensive. So, the, so yeah. the the cost trade off is is uh, is significant. Sure. And so, um, you know, a lot of people are saying, hey, directed energy weapons. This is a a limitless magazine, you mm -hmm. know, you're just yep. pumping out the energy yeah. through a laser or through a high-powered microwave system. So talk about that a little bit. Where, you know, what are you getting from industry in terms of being able to get a system or get systems on ships in the near term that would help with that problem set? So we have, um, so just to come back to explain a little more what I was talking about with that, I'm disappointed. I mean, we've, we've been at this now for a long time. Sure. And uh, so, so two things on that. Um, one is it's taking a while because it's a really hard problem yep. um, to, to, to get a laser on a ship that's more than just a bolt-on but integrated into the weapon system. That's a hard thing to do. Um, so I acknowledge that. Uh, but on the other hand, we can figure it out, too, and we really need to accelerate our efforts uh, there. What we, what we have right now is we've got two systems that we are um, prototyping. Uh, we've got uh, eight um, that are called Odin, that uh, it's, it's a UAV defense 
for the ship okay. that if you think of it like dazzling the UAV uh, to, to kind of break the camera track. That's what Odin does. Okay. What? Uh, how, what how powerful is that? So it's are? it's the the camera is amazingly powerful. Okay. So you can pick things up from a great distance and distances and identify it, which is something oh, we cool. hadn't really expected. But yeah. is that's the feature that the crews like the most. Um, you know, long range identification of things visually is something that you know, like usually. I mean, you, right. you've got binoculars, yeah, you get the, you got big, the big eyes, eyes yeah, right. and then it's about you know ten miles away yeah. uh, until you can get a really good VID. And we've had other camera systems that we've put on ships that that deploy, but we've had nothing like this. Wow. That is really impressive. Um, so we're still testing and experimenting with how the directed energy actually. Dazzles and uh, and then gets the the UAV to uh, not be able to do what it what it's intended to do. The other uh, prototype that we have that we're working on with USS Preble right now is uh, a system called Helios that is completely integrated into the Aegis weapon system. Um, it, on uh, Preble. It's got, okay. On Preble, yeah, yep. the, the, yeah, Preble. Um, it's got uh, four par- power modules that feed the uh, the laser. Um, <clears throat> and we're still working this through. We're, they're out at SWAT right now, um, and have been testing this for the last week. They've been testing it actually, you know, since really last summer. Um, but it's test, refine, test, refine. Sure. We haven't gotten it right yet. Got it. Okay. Um, is that system close to being able to do burn through on an incoming missile? Is that you know, or is this yeah. still aimed at you know low slow flyer UAV kind of thing? It is, it's going to be, we're still working on that. Got it. I think that's that's fair to say. I, I, I don't want to give away too much here, um, but uh, it shows a lot of promise. I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, what it can do when it's fully ready. Yeah. And is that a program of record or is that kind of a one-off technology? This is a, a one-off technology that we're, that we're working on with, uh, with Lockheed Martin, and then we'll see how it goes, and, then, and we'll be able to make some decisions after that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, so a couple years ago, you were the head of the Navy Recruiting Command. Yes. Uh, a lot of news in addition to yep. what's happening in the Gulf of Aden and yeah. the Red Sea right now. Yep. There's a lot of news this week. The Navy just announced that uh, it's going to start allowing people who do not have high school degrees Yep. or, or uh, you know, GEDs yep. to, uh, to enlist. Uh, and the, the CNO recently said, hey, we're, we're in a war for talent. I think, yep. I think every CNO for the last two or three have said yep. we're in a mm-hmm. war for talent. Other service chiefs also. This is a huge, huge problem. Uh, so talk a bit about the quality and the quantity of young people who are coming into the Navy today. Yep. And then, you know, how do we get more Americans to, to join, to yep. be interested in joining, yep. to trust the service to come in? Uh, and, and how do you get them to serve as, as SWOs and as uh, young enlisted professional surface warfare yeah. officers? Really great, really great question. So there's a lot there. Yeah. So let me just uh, talk about first, like what, what I learned in recruiting and uh, what I learned as the, as the captain of a warship. And people like to focus in on ASVAB scores, minimums, what are we doing? Yeah. And then extrapolate from that the quality of the people that we're getting. And while that is a metric um, that shows us something about the potential of the individual, it doesn't show everything. Right. And what, what I would like as, you know, what I would like our captains of warships to, to, to want are people who are hungry to serve their country and serve the Navy. That's what I want. If you have somebody who is um, aggressive, wants to serve, is excited about it, that makes up for so much other stuff. So I, I think it's a great idea that we can bring people in um, without high school degrees. What, uh, when, and I know there's, there's some, probably some hand-wringing somewhere about, well, what are we, are we reducing our standards? What um, the Chief of Naval Personnel said was what we're not going to do is reduce the minimum scores that you need to strike for a rate. You know, you, you know the okay. process. You, you sign up. Uh, you express interest with a Navy recruiter. You go to the MEP station. You get to talk to the uh, to the canvasser, and you sit down and say, okay, what, what would you like to do, Bill? Yeah. And you say, oh, you know, and th- to the point, like, what do people know about, a, about the Navy? 
the only two rates people know about are hospital corpsman and intelligence specialist. Yeah. Right? That's, <laughs> I either want to be a corpsman or I want to be an intel specialist. They don't, you know, and that's just... Yeah, right. Because... Radar technician, be, right, gas like, turbine yeah, mechanic, quartermaster, all that stuff, right? These are yeah. all titles Unknown that yeah. that we in the Navy hold dear yep. because they are our identity. Like, when you're a bosun mate, right. you're a bosun mate for life. Right. Um, but if you're not a bosun mate, then you don't know anything about it, right? So those, so the canvasser kind of helps explain right. to like, with in, in the interview process, what's important to you, what do you like to do, and then they kind of look at the ASVAB score, minimum requirements uh, to get them in there. So, what I, what I'd like to do for your for your listeners is disabuse them of any, hey, we're lowering our standards, we're widening the pool of people that come in, but, you know, we can bring people in, and let them, after they graduate from RTC go straight to a ship. And then as a, as a pack sailor, figure out, this is what I want to do, and then they can strike their rate. Got it. I loved yeah. having sailors like that on my ship because you can kind of train them, mold them, and, uh, and really kind of coach them into this is what I think would work best for you. That, that has a lot of potential. <clears throat> so to, to the last part of your question, what can we do to, to help educate people in America. So I, what, what I'm trying to do is lead with what, what I can control. So the Every Sailor or Recruiter program, we are matching every ship with a school in the fleet concentration areas. We're, we're starting with that. We did this. We started last year in Norfolk and Jacksonville. Um, that shows a lot of promise. And I think I see that as kind of the long game, you know, to the point of if you don't know anything about the Navy, how can you trust that the Navy is is a safe place to work. Right. So, um, talking to kids, you know, reading books uh, to kids in elementary school, introducing them to the concept of service, and this is the uniform, and these are the, you know, this is what the, it's all about. I've done that in elementary schools, and you get the craziest questions because people really have no experience, and it's it's right. it's incredibly endearing. Um, you know, because you're kind of blowing these kids' minds, like, oh my gosh, you know. Yeah. Um, that's uh, and then there's the I think the shorter game, uh, where we have a focused uh, effort with our fleet visits, fleet weeks. Um, you know, all of our ship namesake visits to, mm -hmm. to hometowns, where we're we're going to do that together with the local recruiting district. Um, the recruiters from the the local station will be there with us to be able to. You know, accelerate the contacts into contracts. Got it. So it's kind of How two about? I'm, I'm curious when you had that job as the chief of Navy recruiting com uh, yeah. commander, advertising and reaching young people. You know, when when we were young, uh, we all watched network TV, right? Yep. And so yep. Navy recruiting slogans, you know, on network yep. television ads, right? And nowadays the eyeballs are much more divided. You've yep. got TikTok and, you know, you've got Instagram, you've got social media, you've got Netflix and streaming services and all yep. these different things. Is it harder to reach young people in, in a consistent way because there's so many different things that they're, that they're paying attention to? Yeah, I would say yes and no. Okay. Um, so yes to your point where it used to be simpler. We used to have three television stations and right. everybody watched those. Right. And now uh, to reach people... In the you know the bifurcated interest markets that we have, yes, it's it is harder, no doubt about it. Um, we try to go to the platforms where people who are interested in learning about things, like Reddit, yeah. um, we have a presence there, uh, and then we also um, like YouTube. You know, YouTube for the youth, YouTube is like our Google, yeah. um, and if you type something like "I'm interested in the Navy," go, and then um, we will be able to kind of push you more. If you're interested in this, you might be interested in that. You know, you get that. Yep. Um, we work with Google to be able to, through our ad agency, push content that might interest them more because we've got yep. an amazing amount of thing, and, and we call it America's Navy's YouTube channel, um, that, that are on there. We've got videos, short, very short documentaries that are about five minutes long about people who have served in the Navy from all walks of life with all kinds of background stories. Um, and that is inc incredibly compelling. You know, search and rescue swimmers, uh, doctors, pilots, yep. you know, service warfare officers, nuke electricians. 
everybody has got a story to tell, and that is incredibly compelling. Um, and then we've got those little short little videos that that get a little more. And the last thing that we do is, and we started this one when I was there, is partnering with influencers and inviting them to come with us, like a celebrity yeah. chef would come and prepare a meal or have some kind of a competition with uh, culinary specialists or in the galley uh, on a ship. Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. Or we would have um, guys who do shows about diving, dive with Navy divers. Um, so there's, and then, so then we host them, but in a way we meet them in their content providing. So right. those things are then on their content web pages. Got it. Interesting. So back to ship selection night here, yeah. at, here at the Naval Academy. There's, this is uh, something that did not happen when, when I was a no, mid, right? No. You went down to service selection. You, you, if you're going to be a SWO, you selected your ship that yep. night. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was sort of one at a time because you went in class rank. Yep. But now I don't even know how many years it's been, 10, 15 years now they've done this ship selection night yep. where all the surface warfare officers, they already know they're going to be SWOs. But now they show up and pick their ships, yeah. and they pick their home port, right? Yeah. So they pick a DDG out of uh, Yokosuka or a, one of the FDNF in, yeah. in Rota or, you know, San Diego, Norfolk, wherever yeah. they go. Uh, and it's, there's a tremendous amount of energy uh, to oh, it. It is. Uh, so what, uh, one, your role in the event tonight, and two, what, what are your, what's your message for the soon-to-be surface warfare officers uh, of the fleet? Right. So... My, my role in it is, um, at this point, very small. I'll, I, and it's really super easy. I just get to stand there and shake their hands. Cool. So what right. we're going to have That's is it'll, it'll be me, uh, Joe Cahill from Surfland. Yep. Uh, we'll have uh, Lieutenant General Brian Kavanaugh uh, from the United States Marine Corps, you know, because it's a Navy Marine Corps team. Yep. Um, and then we'll also have uh, Admiral Fred Pyle as N96, our resource sponsor. We will all be on the stage uh, and getting to congratulate each midshipman as they uh, pick, after they pick their ship. Um, and so that's fun. What my role is, like before that, is making sure that they're all ready to go. Uh, for that. So, you know, I work closely with the superintendent and with the uh, professional development uh, division here at the, uh, the Naval Academy to make sure that they're, they're getting everything they need training wise. Um, and then we, we also send a uh, surfland officer up here. Last year it was Andy Blanco. This year it was Rich Itel um, to kind of open the books to show ship schedules, these are the home port changes, these are the avails coming up, uh, and to try to coach them up as best possible um, for for what they want. Because yeah. this is this is a life changing decision. Sure. And I, I don't think he would mind me telling this this quick sea story. There's an old shipmate of mine, Jeff Wollstenholm, um, and he found out shortly before um, ship selection night, you know. 35 years ago or more right. that um, he was not going to be able to go aviation. And he hadn't really spent a lot of time thinking about surface warfare in his three and a half, yeah. you know, almost four years at the Naval Academy. Right. So then it was kind of like, ha, huh. you know, so he goes, you know, back then, you know, we did it in um, was it Memorial Hall right. or, or something yep. like that. Memorial Hall. He goes in, you know, the, 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 the CNAV officers are kind of coaching you as you're going, like, what do you want to do? Yeah. You know, don't pick that ship. Um, so he, he's standing there, and he's looking at the board, and there's a ship that's home ported in uh, Gaeta, Italy. And he's like, huh, that looks kind of cool. You know, I'm not, you know, because I had different expectations just a few days ago, I'm not planning on spending a lot of time in the Navy anymore, right. so I'll pick that ship. He, he goes to Gaeta to go to a ship. He meets his wife, um, who's a, uh, an Italian and uh, he ends up spending, you know, 30 years or more in the Navy. I remember hearing this story that he told at his retirement ceremony in Naples, Italy. And the adventures, the wonderful life he's had, all those things came from that first ship that he picked and how life-changing and important it was. And, and he was, he was kind of telling it like a joke, like, you know, I didn't really spend a lot of time thinking about it. Yeah. Thank luck, goodness. Luck of the draw. Thank yeah. God right. it turned out okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, that's uh, an exciting night for the Mids. I'm glad that you could be here for that. And I know uh, uh, our boss, Admiral Spicer, is going to be there tonight. And, uh, yeah, there's just a tremendous amount of uh, very cool energy. And I think it's great also 
because I don't remember, I'm 87, your class of 90. I don't remember um, there being that much information about where the ships were in their sort of schedule, right? right. So, so you, you know, nowadays, they'll know tonight, I'm not just picking uh, this D DDG in Yokosuka, but is she coming out of uh, an availability right. and getting ready to go on deployment exactly. and workups? Right. Or, or is this a ship that's getting ready to come back from deployment and will go into an availability yeah. and, and I'm factoring Absolutely. in a, a maintenance period, right? Yeah. So, you, it, you know, it helps to be aware of that, not right. just what ship you're going and where she's home ported, but also uh, where she is in her life cycle. Exactly. Yeah. And down to, we were able to tell them kind of down to the deployment dates, because we're able to do that here in Hopper Hall, where yep. it's, a, it's, it's a classified space. Um, and then you can kind of also help coach the mids on, and this is the, these are the B-Doc dates I would go for, mm. right? Because you're not going to your ship until you've gone to B-Doc first. Right. And, uh, Basic division and officer, officer course, course yep. right? right? And uh, so you, you, you do that, so you kind of have to include that timeline, like, you know, they're leaving on deployment this date. You know, so you might want not, not pick them, but yeah. pick them. So they have an, an amazing amount of information provided to them to help them make their decision. Yeah, that's terrific. Well, sir, uh, I know you're out of time, and you've got a very busy schedule and off to meet with some of the midshipmen and the SWO lieutenants here on the staff at the Naval Academy. So I just want to thank you for, for stopping by today. This has been great, and I, I hope that this will become a, um, a, yeah, a, I look a recurring to thing. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll have lots to talk about next year. My guest today has been Vice Admiral Brendan McLean, the Navy's SWO boss. Admiral, thanks for stopping by, and uh, good luck and happy hunting uh, to all the members of the surface warfare community. We're thinking about them as they're out in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, yeah. protecting maritime sh you know, shipping, Operation Prosperity Guardian. They are doing the nation's duty, and, uh, and we salute them. And uh, today's show is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute since 1873, 150 plus years now. Our members have been the foundation of everything that we do from USNI news to proceedings to naval history, events and conferences, and the books that we publish. If you're not a member, go to usni.org forward slash join today and become a member of the Institute. If you are a member, tell a friend or a shipmate to become a member as well. And if, we, uh, if you're in, in San Diego, two weeks from now, 13, 14, 15 February is our annual West Conference. Uh, stop by the Naval Institute booth, come by if you're active duty, it is free for uh, entrance, so come by, see panel discussions, the CNO will be there, SECNAV will be there, the heads of the communities of the Navy, a uh, whole bunch of, you know, uh, important, uh, Admiral Paparo from uh, the PAC Fleet Commander will be there. Uh, it's always a great event, so stop by West and, uh, and we, we look forward to seeing you, seeing you there. And until then, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.